you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, we are back and this might only be shown on Christmas Day. If it's on Christmas Day, happy Christmas. God bless all of you. Thank you for being here. General, in the last episode, we spoke about your arrival at uh, Special Forces Brigade. And now the commander, he revealed uh, some magical operations. And we thank you again for your time. Can we talk further now about your time in Special Forces, the training regime, how things perhaps have changed and so forth? Of course, yes. Uh, I'll kick off with the very big operation we had in Lesotho, Operation Bolias. Uh, remember, Lesotho is an enclave, an enclave in South Africa between the town, the eastern province, as well as the uh, Free State. It's a small mountain kingdom, most beautiful place. Uh, with very good people. They also rely on South Africa for, for, for jobs and uh, all, all commodities. In the past, the Russians and Chinese had embassies in that area. Uh, and uh, we also had a few operations uh, against the ANC and the PAC in, 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 in Lesotho. But now we were in 95, and uh, I think there was a, a climate in the world, if you look at the spring fever that uh, aroused in Tunis, I think the whole world was disrupted. I don't know why, and I can't put my finger to it. But the people in, in, in Lesotho uh, was not happy with the kingdom and the way things were done. I personally had quite a good knowledge of Lesotho because we trained the Lesotho army uh, while I was in uh, Kimberley. I went there quite often. and We also trained them inside. Uh, the, the, the Lesotho people are, are, are good people. And I think the African Union felt that it was necessary that South Africa and uh, Botswana go in there and, and, and just calm and defuse the uprising. They didn't, it's, it's not good for Africa to have uh, coup d'etats and to overthrow governments. Uh, uh, it is not good. Uh, I think there they, they were right. When things started getting sour, uh, we sent in our operators into that area, in, into the Sutu. They went in civilian clothes. And you know, they could all speak the Sutu, Southern Sutu, fluently. Some of them even came not from the Sutu, but they came from the Free State. And uh, they can intermingle and carry on uh, as normal people in that area. The information that we got is that. Uh, the unrest situation is, is very acute. It's, it's actually uh, endemic, at, 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 was endemic at that moment. They also told, and I knew this, that the soldiers of the Sutu, in the evening, he goes home with his service rifle and 50 rounds. So in his area, his township where he lives, he, he, he can start shooting should there be an enemy. Uh, we got together at the Chief of National Defense Force office and uh, we told him uh, it's not a matter of just going into Lesotho. No, <clears throat> the rattles and guns must go in there and the people will run. Uh, uh, we had a different view. And the, again, politics forced us because it was pressure uh, on our government to intervene there. We were the closest. And obviously an unrest in Lesotho is to the detriment of South Africa as well. And uh, what happened there 
it was a, an unfortunate situation. When the helicopter landed at the Katsi Dam, the Lesotho soldiers were not told what, what was the, the old situation, and a few of our chaps were killed there. Uh, luckily, it was not a, a grand scale of, of, of bloodshed, and we could defuse the, the situation. Uh, General Solichauke, then he was a brigadier, he was put in charge of, of Bolias. I went and I visited the men there. Uh, at that stage, it was, was getting all calm. And uh, my people that were there, we got them together and we brought them out because they did what we had to do. But our initial intelligence, and really, uh, this is a problem. We didn't have that hot intelligence, except from, from our guys telling us about the climate and the fact that uh, the Lesotho Defense Force goes home with their rifles. So you can expect, my words were, you can expect the contact around every corner when we move in there. That's why we went in with rifles and, and, and uh, it worked very well. Uh, Lesotho was also a turning point uh, in, in Southern Africa after that. Uh, things calm down. There's a, a, a newer government. Uh, but uh, the government changes every every second to third year. It, it, it still changes, which is actually perhaps a good thing. Uh, at the moment, Lesotho is, is, is very quiet. And I think uh, it, it's, it's going to stay that way. But the lives lost there was, was unnecessary. Uh, but unfortunately, this is this is war. This is curbing uh, any unrest situation and and the problem uh, that you have, uh, especially in, in in Africa. This was a, a a very big operation for us. Then we partake we partook in in all the exercises uh, in Southern Africa that was done, and we played the special forces role to during exercise circumstances to uh, get information and to pass it through and to operate as well. It was good for us to work with conventional forces, uh, the Air Force, and that it was, was, was absolutely necessary that, that we also brush that up. I want to talk about the cycle. The cycle of a special forces operator takes about a year. I'm not going to go into the depth of every every operation. There's a pre-selection which uh, focuses on the fitness, the physical fitness of the man and the psychological uh, capability. Uh, being prepared to take pressure and to handle pressure and to work as a team. This is very important to work as a team. In the guys uh, that pass the pre-selection uh, are put on various courses, S small tactics, those who is not qualified uh, in, in parachute jumping, basic parachuting, and they can go on, on, on parachute courses. And then they start with uh, minor tactics, demolitions, and uh, all sorts of weapons from artillery right down to Air Force weapons to the army weapons and the special forces weapons. They must be able to dismantle and to fix any weapon at any stage. That is very important. Then a survival course where they uh, learn to survive in, a, in, in, in the bush. In the city, it's easier to survive. If you don't have money or something, you just steal and then you can carry on. That's just a joke. And uh, then there's uh, combined exercises that you do. And the student is on a constant observation. Some of the, some of the phases of the uh, cycle is very strenuous. But it is human because people can pass it. And that's why in special forces, with your operators, you don't have a problem because they are physically fit, they are mentally fit, they are mentally capable, and they are eager to study and to better their career 
at every moment. And that is the main thing on a constant basis. We do subjects like mountain climbing, uh, first it at a very high level, mountaineering, uh, the use of ropes. And, and really the guy goes through to a test every day of the cycle. And if he passes that cycle, he's a badged operator, he gets a badge and uh, he can be used in all kinds of operations. We also cover urban operations. We uh, cover uh, obviously tactical operations in, in the bush and even as uh, operation streetwise lately came in. We had to train them in, in streetwise. One of the tactics that came from them was that they, if, if they had to go into an area and to uh, capture somebody in the crowd, they, they toy toy as if they are toying, and then they toy toy right into the area where this guy is, they grab him and then they toy toy out, you know, chanting whatever they, they, they want to chant. And this is how they arrest the guy. And then fighting in built up areas is also important. How to work with aircraft. And once this operator is, is qualified, uh, he must further himself in his career for promotion courses, and other courses that, that, that can really help him. But once he's, he's finished, he's a jack of many trades and he's gonna master them all. The equipment, obviously it, it is special to special forces. I talked about the bat vehicle that was invented in special forces. Uh, now I see they've got new, uh, a new generation vehicles. I think it is time for a newer generation. But the bat vehicle has saved our bacon, as I said, in Utata and in various uh, operations outside South Africa. We also had boats, uh, semi-rigid boats that uh, could be loaded onto naval ships, and then launched into the sea. For a quick release, we also could uh, para drop them out of a C-130 aircraft, and then the jumpers jump behind, so you've got a tactical advantage uh, on, on your target, if you can do this. So parachuting into the sea is, is a reality, because the, your, your semi-rigid boat is ready to be there. We did various exercises with the Navy. And the Navy understands us, and we understand the Navy. The Navy is different than the Army. They've got a different culture, but a very good culture. I'm very proud to say that, that, that our Navy is small, but it is efficient. Uh, obviously, with the uh, Air Force, the same applies. We also invented, uh, not invented, we started using the tandem parachutes with two people uh, is deployed under a canopy and you can uh, take a non-paratrooper or a non-free faller into a combat zone, a medical person, an intelligence person, or somebody that you need for, for, for that operation. In my later day, this was the way I did my parachuting, is with, with tandem, because another guy takes all the punch, uh, but, the, but the landing was normally uh, a bit difficult. Uh, you, you've got to know how to operate it, but it was great. I never got it. And I did about 50 tandem jumps, which was very nice. And the guys appreciated it, the fact that I could jump with it. Uh, was, then I want to tell you about a certain incident that, that happened to us. If you can recall back into the bush wall, there was a guy from the mesh that was captured near Ilundu in 1980. Now the man uh, who carried out this operation was a man called Danger Ashipala, very high-ranking Swapu officer. Coincidentally, the nickname of Brigadier Barnos was also Danger. Uh, so we had our own Danger and they had their Danger. And one day through the military uh, attache in, in Namibia, 
I receive a call, danger wants to come and see me. I said, I know who's danger. He's more than welcome. And he came into my office one day on a, on a visit. Him and two of his colonels. And um, the main thing was he was asking me whether we've got problems with the Namibians. And I said, yes, we have. There are people that smuggle uh, weapons from uh, Angola into South Africa, into the Transkai, the old Transkai. And uh, we had names because our teams were there. Our teams operated in Namibia to try and curb this situation. We did this operation with the South African police. And I gave a danger a, a name list of people and he solved the problem. And that, that stopped. Uh, but it was very interesting having him in my office. They first started off in highfalutin English, but I could see they struggled with the English. And I know all the Uvambu people can talk Afrikaans. And I said to him, Commander Danger, let's rather speak Afrikaans. <laughs> and immediately, he was at ease, and these two colonels as well, and we spoke in Afrikaans. And I had a woman on my staff, Sergeant Major Monica Antonio. She came from Wamberland, from Inana, where my base was. And I didn't know her then. And she was ordered to bring in the tea. It was arranged. And when she came in, she greeted them. The poor old danger had tears in his eyes. He said to me, here he sits in South Africa. And a woman comes in and serves him in his own language. Tea. That is fantastic. No, we had a, a very nice chat about <laughs> all the operations that we had there. Where was he? Where was I? He knew everything about me. Well, I knew everything about him as well. And uh, really, uh, he was a good guy. After that, he even met on a mess and his wife. You know, danger uh, died, I think, a year or so ago later but uh, uh, we were really friends like old, old comrades speaking but this was one of the the, the main uh, stories that that we could have um, in in the running of special forces uh, we also had to change certain units and close down certain units we closed down one a special Forces Regiment in Durban. And then that was a very sad day. Uh, some of the Rekis uh, blamed me for that, but it's, it's not that. Uh, we had to do it due to budget constraints. All the people were, uh, were absorbed by the, the other units. And uh, it... it, it uh, we had a, a, a new place for the school near, near Pretoria, and the functions were, were carried out by the various units. Uh, yeah, it was a sad day because Durban played a, a very important role uh, uh, in special forces. The operators there operated in a tell. They did a lot of good work, and especially with the seaward situations, they also operated from there. And... Uh, it was a very nice place to do para jumping in that area, but these these things happen, and unfortunately, it happened today. Uh, of course, I'll be honest with you, I'm uh, not at their doorstep every day, but it's going very well with special forces. Uh, the headquarters uh, is still uh, in Pretoria. Uh, uh, with very good staff, uh, four special forces regiment in, in in Cape Town. It's going well with them uh, in in Langebaan near Cape Town. Five special forces regiment in Palaborwa is going very well. The school is going very well, uh, close to Mostal, and our maintenance unit is also thriving at at the moment. It's it's going very well with the guys. It is positive. We have the. Uh, special Forces League that supports all the guys, operators the other day, they 
uh, one of our sergeant majors that retired, Mike Mishai, uh, he went for a jog and he went down with a heart attack. And it was us, uh, the Special Forces League, that went and got hold of his body and that helped the family with the uh, funeral. Uh, it's 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 really uh, very very uh, heartwarming to see that that we still stand together. It's a band of brothers, as they always say. It's it's always uh, good to see each other. Uh, we meet quite often, and we talk of the old days. There's no, and I'm very open with this. There's no political plans for the future that we do this and we're going to carry out this. The guys are all level-headed. Uh, we don't belong to uh, funny organizations. And uh, South Africa is our, our homestead and this is where we're going to stay. Uh, I can give advice. Uh, I've, I've given it here generally to the soldiers is that we must uh, learn the African languages. And as I said, French and Portuguese, Portuguese is not a problem. Uh, we must learn the Shona because all the guys that came over from Zimbabwe are now all retired. Uh, Shona and, well, if you speak Zulu, you speak the Indabele of, of, of uh, Zimbabwe. And if you speak Portuguese, uh, I found out three years ago, I was up in the north of, of, of Mozambique on a trip, nothing to do with the military. And uh, I found that, that the older people don't speak Portuguese anymore, and the younger people as well. Uh, that we must curb. And then in Angola, the, the Portuguese uh, language is, is still going. Uh, but Swahili is also an important language for us to learn. Uh, if I want to project uh, for further operations in, in Africa, obviously, it will be uh, uh, peacekeeping type of operations like we are busy with in the Congo. And I think that uh, Mozambique is going to turn into that as well. That's from a layman's point of view. And really, um, it, it was a great tour that I had. And I was very sorry the day that I, that I left uh, Special Forces. But we are still in contact and uh, we are still there. Of course, uh, at the moment, uh, if you want to ask any question, I think it's a good good time. Yeah, so I was listening and of course I have a few few questions like always. How do you feel as a soldier regarding spies? Because a lot of your work in South Africa is actually in a certain way espionage. Of course, yes. Uh, obviously, uh, working in the field of special forces and uh, going over to, to other countries, uh, there is uh, espionage. Uh, there are various ways to do espionage. One was, and it is, it is uh, one of our tasks was to go to our embassies in Southern Africa and to look at their evacuation plans. And then obviously you, you learn from their defense force, but we always did it in an overt way. We always went to their uh, defense headquarters and said, listen, we are here. We are going to the embassy and we are checking their security and evacuation plans. That's what we are doing here. Obviously you pick up things and uh, you meet these guys. And what we all, always did, say for instance, we went to Malawi, we went to the embassy here in Malawi, and we told them that we are going, that's what we're gonna do. In this way, you you, you uh, get acquainted with the uh, embassy here in Pretoria, you know the personalities there, and when you come back, you report to them what, what you found out, you even give them a copy of the, of the, of the evacuation plan. And when you're there, you speak, speak to them. We did this in Tanzania and, and, and all the countries uh, in Southern Africa. Uh, that's one way of going there, doing it in the overt way. It is not spying. 
Then, secondly, uh, we have sent people to look at the infrastructure of certain countries. Uh, roadways, waterways, uh, uh, landing strips, and this type of thing. Should an operation arise in that area, whether it could be a peacekeeping operation or a, a normal operation or going to evacuate some of our people there, then you've got the knowledge and everything is there. And today with uh, GPS, the whole plan is on a GPS stuffing. And the guy just plugs it into a, a computer and he's got a layout of the, of the whole area. And then there's the cloak and dagger stories where a guy goes in undercover to find out things like James Bond does. I'm, I'm not uh, uh, degrading James Bond, but, but I'm referring to this type of operation that the people can understand that. Uh, obviously, uh, every country has got his spies. This is one way by means of espionage to know what your neighbor is doing or what your enemy is doing. At the moment, we don't have enemies in Africa, which is a good thing. You don't have to do it uh, the nasty way. But coming to spies, if you catch a spy, uh, there are laws that control them. And if you have own spies or traitors in your own ranks, to me that is, that is bad. We had the examples in the Anglo World War of people joining the British and so forth. Uh, and still today, certain families don't speak to each other due to that situation of joiners and, and they were nothing else but spies. Uh, in our defense force, we had people uh, I'm talking of white people going over to the other side, trying to sell stuff to uh, the East Block and so forth. Uh, they were apprehended and uh, they were dealt with. There was a very high-ranking naval officer. Uh, people will know who it is. Peter Gerard, uh, regarding operations when uh, he was the commander of the dockyard, in Simonstown, whenever we prepared for operations, obviously he phoned the other side. To me, that is a problem. Uh, and, 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 and spies in your, your inner uh, ranks is, is, is also another big problem. So uh, this is my, my own viewpoint. Special Forces is not spies. They reconnaissance, they do reconnaissance and uh, there are various ways to execute their tasks. I just want to say here yeah, that uh, Peter Garrod, of course, was being pardoned. He was uh, released. Yeah, I was think pardoned. he was uh, promoted and then he was placed on retirement. And fine, such is life. But now I need to ask you, sir, since we know now that Special Forces has a capacity to work on the cover, inside South Africa, do we as normal citizens need to fear what special forces are up to? Not at all, not at all, Chris. I, I, as I say, I can't vouch for the present situation, but uh, there's, no, there's no fear that uh, uh, we will intimidate the local population or go and knock at the guy's door and leave a bomb there and kill him and this sort of thing and assassinating. Most definitely, that is not the work of a special forces operator. In the past, these things happened, but then it was when there was a, uh, a red and a blue group. Yeah, you, 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 you got this type of thing. Luckily, I was never involved in, in, in this type of thing and these type of operations. I've heard somewhere so that special forces are sometimes used to test by security. In other words, they might go and sort of mock attack, say, a ammunition storage place, just to be sure that these people actually are doing their jobs. Have you ever been involved in such things? Yes, of course. Uh, it's, it's a good exercise for, 
for special forces as well to to infiltrate and penetrate into uh, our own own places. Uh, we've done this with the Air Force uh, to check their Air Force security, guarding airplanes and weapons. Uh, we've done various exercises with this. Uh, it, it's good for both sides, but provided there's no uh, sharp ammunition. Otherwise, you know, uh, the, these guys on the receiving end, oh, the Rekis are coming and, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they're wide awake, but please, no, no live ammunition. Other, otherwise, you know, the, the guy gets a fright and he sees this vicious thing coming, coming towards him. So we, we do have exercises like that, but it's, it's, it's good for both sides. What should I say if, if, if this is agreed between the commanders, I'm trying to figure out how this works. Let's say that you are now wanting to attack Watercliff Air Force Base for some reason, for this reason, actually. The moment we take away the life ammunition from the guards, we should figure out that uh, something's going to happen. You know, let's say the, you know, the naval base at Simon's top. How, how, do you, how do you work this out at senior command? No, uh, the people on the ground will know it's an exercise. This is not a, it's not a real attack because we must always be careful. Uh, the guy could have a, a round up his sleeve. And there are exercise rules. There are what we call empires who evaluate each uh, situation to uh, try and prevent that nobody gets hurt. But the main thing is the receiving end, say for instance, uh, Waterkloof uh, Air Force Base, the security are warned that this is an exercise and people are going to try to penetrate. Uh, and out of that comes lessons. Uh, you most definitely, but, but pre-warn everybody, they must know it's an exercise, it's not a story. And, and you can't surprise people. I can't leave guards guarding the place with, with live ammunition and then try and have a surprise attack on them because then people are going to get killed from both sides. But it's an official exercise with written rules and there are empires and uh, the people are pre-warned and they must know it's an exercise. This is not the real thing. Well, that Otherwise, makes you're going to have a problem. That makes sense, sir, because if a guy's for, for warned, it makes it harder for you. So in other words, that's actually better. It will be less hard when you do it for real because you'll just arrive. No, that is so. But these things are not done against other countries. I mean, there's no way you can start a war by accident. No, 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 no. You, uh, no, I, I don't think that will be allowed. To try and infiltrate into, say, for, let's take an example into Zimbabwe into their uh, headquarters. Uh, no, uh, that, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. They must do their own probes, and their own exercises. Blue on blue, not, not blue on red. Now I'm thinking, yes, uh, that vehicle you're talking about at Bobo Tatswana at Mbatu, that you call the bat vehicle, I think, wasn't that, also called the Yakals or something. It's like a small Willis No, no. Is it not that thing? The Yakals was, the Yakals was with the paratrooper brigade. The Yakals. Uh, that could be uh, parachuted out of an aircraft uh, once uh, landed in uh, on, the, on the ground. Uh, the, the paratrooper commander or whoever has got mobility. No. The Yakals is a paratrooper vehicle. It can take four people or it can take some ammunition or whatever the case might be. There were also a little, uh, before we had quad bikes, there was a Tico car, we had four wheels, very light uh, little motorbike thing. But that, that, that's redundant. Uh, and uh, the Yakos is most definitely for the, for the paratrooper pretend. The bat uh, a vehicle could house a driver and a gunner in front and uh, four people at the back facing backwards and two facing side sidewards. 
So you've got all round the fence, you've got a machine gun on it, and you've got your driver being protected. And there are, uh, the people at the back are armed with anti-tank weapons, any any configuration of, of weapons that you want. And it's normally a 5.0 Browning or a 7.62 Browning that you've got on, 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 on the vehicle up in front. It's a light vehicle, but it can carry the packs of, of, of the people that you wanted. Now, we spoke about this before, sir, but during your time, was this fight between the paratroopers and their selection and the special forces guys doing the, the static jump course, was that fight still ongoing? No, no not at all. Uh, one of my objectives was to, to build very good relations with the parachute fraternity. The commander then was Pit Nell. Unfortunately, just after he retired, he was killed by a, a muggy gang uh, in Johannesburg. Very good chap. And of course, Mr. Parachute, oh, Sergeant Major, well, he became a Lieutenant Colonel, Johnny Kisser, Mr. Parachute in South Africa. Uh, and uh, we spoke to each other and we had very good communication. Uh, our guys were received very well at the Parachute Battalion, and whenever we trained them, especially on uh, survival tactics and various other things that they deemed necessary, we treated them very well. And some of them were even instructors at certain phases on our selection course. So, uh, uh, and, and listen, uh, from the Parachute Brigade, uh, it was a a good stream of recruitment for special forces because the guys already proved themselves as being paratroops. Now, uh, I went to Bluffton quite often. Obviously, always uh, participated in some other jump. And then uh, we had uh, good forms with each other. I, I, I never felt any, any, any problem. Never, never. I've heard, of course, that uh, because you stated to me and James Tate confirmed the beer drinking exercise on a tandem jump. But I, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> perhaps uh, if somebody has missed the story, perhaps you can just tell us again quickly. <laughs> uh, it, it was, uh, there was a big exercise on the go in uh, Madibu. Uh, that's to the eastern part of, of Musina on the Zimbabwean border. And uh, we jumped, jumped quite a, from a high altitude with James Taita. He said, they called them the tandem master. He was trained to uh, take a passenger. And I was then just a passenger. And uh, we did a, a high opening high altitude, high opening jump without oxygen. And the moment the canopy was deployed and everything was stable, he, was, he trimmed it nicely and we were now going for the drop zone. Out of his jacket came a cold beer. He said to me, sir, here's a beer for you. You only the passenger, you may drink this beer. I'm not allowed till I'm on the ground. And that was the nicest beer I've ever had. <laughs> and, uh, to my detriment, I, I, I dropped that can <laughs> in the Limpopo River. <laughs> well, it's now at Shai Shai at the moment. But uh, yeah, it, it, it was nice. Uh, I, I jumped quite a few times with, uh, with old, uh, old James. One night with a night jump. And then I also did a, a high altitude jump with oxygen. That was quite an experience, a halo. High altitude, low opening, where you free fall for over a minute. And uh, it was uh, an experience. It was also there, there at Madimbu. I recall that uh, was... there was an incident in, in, in the 1970s with a passenger ship the Queen Elizabeth II. And some wanker made a bomb threat against the ship. And it just happened to be that the ship was in the middle of the Atlantic, it was crossing. 
probably towards Britain. So it couldn't turn around. And so the Brits decided to fly a bomb expert, bomb disposal officer in a, a Royal Engineer officer, but he couldn't jump. He didn't know how. And anyway, so they took off and it was either the SAS or SBS and they trained him in a parachute jump while on the aircraft in the Hercules on their way to jump. And so we, he did a static line jump for the first time in his life out of that aircraft into the Atlantic. And uh, the ship's boats picked him up and they, well, they had a party until they got back home again because they were... <laughs> <laughs> they didn't find any bomb. They did find a few things, but not a bomb. Now, these were in the times of Northern Ireland, of course. So it could have happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they didn't use the tandem jump. That, and I never knew that you can do a tandem jump with oxygen that high. I, uh, I've learned something. No, uh, I, I, I did it at my matured age. And I, uh, it was... Uh, uh, very nice, and I did some water jumps as well. And the one water jump uh, I was with was Sergeant Major Smiley. And, uh, we had to do a cutaway. The main parachute didn't open. We, then the, the second chance is your, you know, was in the air. I could hear the people shout on the on the boat, but luckily it, it opened and. Uh, he landed so no all these things can happen but the tandem uh, is, is is a very very good thing to to use in in, in in war time it's a very big big parachute and it can take quite quite a load and in instances we we've never in the real operations the tandem jumps but i mean the capability is there and the tandem masters in my time, there was about eight special forces guys being uh, qualified as tandem masters. Uh, they were seasoned paratroopers, and they knew everything about parachute. And they knew how to handle it. My, my other favorite partner in tandem was uh, the Sergeant Major, uh, ex Rhodesian. Uh, and... Uh, we used to speak Zulu to each other while under the canopy. So that was quite an experience to me as well. <laughs> but uh, okay, good, a good guy. I had about 10 jumps with him. Yeah, it was excellent. Did the Special Forces train their own people in, in parachuting or, or did they still go through the parachute school in Bloemfontein? No, we went through the parachute. We went through the parachute battalion. Obviously, uh, 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 specialized training uh, on certain equipment and certain ways of uh, doing uh, parachute jumps without being detected. Uh, we did in training and uh, perfected it. But the basic course, uh, the parachute battalion did the basic static line course. They also did the basic pre fall course. Then they did the tandem masters course. They also trained the tandem masters. And then also the uh, pre-fall instructors course, the parachute battalion did. After that, uh, it was fine. Then you could uh, could operate there. Well, you know, you know, we've come at the end of a long, long road of many, many hours of recording. <laughs> I must tell you, it was a great pleasure and a great honor, and I'm really grateful to you. It's interesting to me that you've had almost no negative comments or thumbs down or anything like that. And that's not my chance. So I wish to thank you, sir. I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank you for your time. And I want to say to everybody who's been watching here, join this project. Come and talk to me. All of you are welcome. We can learn from each other. Until we meet again, God bless. Thank you, Chris. Same to you.